<laughs> in 2002, David Jones, the creator of the original Grand Theft Auto games, started a new game development studio called Real Time Worlds. David's dream with this studio was to create an MMO that evoked the sense you felt when you played Grand Theft Auto, which is a stupid idea and it would never work. What are you looking behind me for? He envisioned a game where players could be criminals completing missions by working together to do crimes and whatnot. Or you could be an enforcer where you try and you stop the crimes. It's like a cop, but they called it an enforcer. This dream game was called APB. It was an ambitious game, but David himself said back in 2005 that the game would be released in only two years in 2007. But as 2007 came and went, nothing was heard of about APB. This game would be delayed over and over and over again until finally in 2010 it had a confirmed release date and this time they meant it. And the hype was huge, this was a studio that had already produced games like Crackdown which were really well reviewed and obviously had the creator of Grand Theft Auto behind it. This game was even turning up on lists from Wired about the most anticipated games of the year. It was alongside titans like Halo Reach, Mass Effect 2, Ep uh, Epic Mickey. Yeah, Epic Mickey, we all remember Epic Mickey. And when Grand Theft Auto Online, well, sorry, when APB finally did come out, it went terribly. The game was plagued with bugs, frame rate issues, there was a general lack of depth with only like 20 hours of gameplay, which for an MMO is astonishingly low. It just felt like the game was released in an unfinished state, which luckily is not an issue we have these days. When asked about the low review scores for APB, David Jones had only one thing to say, and that's that players just didn't get it. <laughs> All in all, it was not only a critical disaster, but the game cost over a hundred million dollars to make, which meant it was a financial disaster too. For context, the developers of The Witcher 3 said that game took 81 million dollars to make. It took 20 million fewer dollars to make The Witcher 3 than it took to make this. Huh? All of this became too much to handle for real-time worlds, and just 79 days after the launch of APB, the servers would be taken offline and the company would go out of business. APB would stand as the shortest running MMO of all time, and a cautionary tale for any young development studio hoping to break into the genre. With how disastrous APB was though, surely the record of 79 days would never be broken. Surely it would never be broken. So the day before just came out and then it shut down and then the company that made it also shut down and now the CEO is missing and no one knows what's going on and everyone's mad and a lot of money got scammed and uh, it's all very scary. We should, we should start at the beginning. The day before, at one point, Steam's most wish-listed game, boasting itself as a state-of-the-art post-apocalyptic survival MMO. It was first announced through a trailer on IGN's YouTube channel back in January of 2021, and it instantly captured the attention of not just MMO gamers, but gamers as a whole. Wait a second, this image looks familiar. Where do I recognize this from? The trailer featured a stunningly detailed post-apocalyptic world where two definitely real players were traversing the rubbles of a ruined city looking for supplies and stuff, having definitely real interactions with each other. Running out of fuel. Great, man. Awesome. Shall we split up? Yep. Oh, shit. And I mean, just look at how excited the comments were about this game. This looks so amazing. Can't wait to play. This game looks amazing. So much love the shooting mechanics. Would surely play it. Oh, yeah. I know where I recognize this from. But there was also a lot of skepticism about this game, maybe because of the relatively recent disappointments of games like Cyber... Cyber... Cyberpunk 2077. I set this up beforehand. I prepared. <laughs> or maybe it's because the game industry has been bending its player base over the counter and having its way with them unconsensually for the last, you know, like forever, basically the whole time. There wasn't a whole lot to cling on to from the trailer since it didn't show off any new mechanics or character progression to make it separate from games like DayZ or The Division. Luckily, the CEO of Fantastic, the developer behind the day before, did an interview with IGN where they divulged some of the secrets in the day before. In the day before, we have the concept of a base different from other MMO survival games. As a hint, we really like the concept of that cute game where there is a greedy raccoon boss. What? I think that means there's base building, but I, I don't actually know. I don't know. But the hype train nevertheless chugged along, and on October 15th, 2021, the day before, released its next trailer, and this one had a release date in it. Oh, 
Whoop, sorry, just let me get over here. Okay, there we go, that's better. This announcement garnered even more hype than the original trailer, probably because of the release date being so close to the reveal of the game. I mean, usually you have to wait years and years for a game like this, but they're turning it around into just over a year. That's incredible. I mean, Fear Engine even said they were willing to wait two, maybe even three more years if they had to, but surely they won't have to. And so as the release date of June 2022 approached, the game was delayed eight months to March of 2023. It's so bright out here, I can't see anything. Usually game delays are done so that the product that's eventually delivered to the players is the best it can possibly be, meaning adding on little polish or maybe finishing quest lines that haven't been quite wrapped up yet or optimizing performance. I'm kidding, they don't do that anymore. Very rarely though are delays meant to transition massive open world MMOs that are almost done to an entirely new game engine. That's why they delayed it. They wanted eight months to entirely change game engines. Eight months is a long time, don't get me wrong, but changing your game engine, you know, the thing that the entire game is built on, should probably take longer than the gestation period of a premature baby. It takes so much work to do this, especially if your game was actually in a place where it was basically ready to be released. That means your game was pretty friggin' big. And apparently Fantastic agreed that it was a lot of work because they started asking for unpaid labor. Sorry, I mean volunteers. They were literally asking for unpaid volunteers on a for-profit project. That's insane. What's even more insane is the response the CEO of Fantastic gave about the whole situation. Essentially, the word volunteer comes from the Latin words voluntaris, meaning willing or of one's own choice. This is what you're doing? This is how you're starting the statement? Whatever you do in life, you only have two choices. Do it willingly or unwillingly. You could also just not do it. I mean, that's always an option. <laughs> if you help a stranger carry heavy boxes into their house willingly, you enjoy it. If you carry those heavy boxes unwillingly, every moment will be like torture. So volunteering means you bring a certain pleasantness to every action you take. You don't, just because you do something willingly doesn't mean you enjoy it. It just means you're doing it willingly. It's, it means you're not being forced. If, if you're doing something unwillingly, like carrying boxes into a stranger's house, then yeah, yeah, that's like torture. That sounds like you're being tortured. <laughs> we consider all team members, including employees, volunteers. This idea comes from our own experience and aspiration. We, the founders of Fantastic, consider ourselves volunteers not only for Fantastic, but in every sphere of life. No, ju just no. What truly boggles my mind reading through this statement is the way they try and pass off every single member of their team, unpaid, paid, full-time, part-time, as being a volunteer. Every time they call someone a volunteer, they have to put a parenthetical next to it in the statement to say what they actually are. Enthusiastic volunteers, supporter, external volunteers, supporter, internal volunteers, employees. I don't know, it just seems like there's already words that fit what you're trying to say and you don't need to switch everything to being a volunteer, Edward. It, it seems like the English language has it covered for you. This is where things start to go off the rails for the day before. With all these delays and reports of unpaid labor, <laughs> sorry, I mean volunteering, it was time for some good PR. Sorry, I stopped chopping redwoods in RuneScape. Just give me a second here. It took until February 2nd, which was only a month and a half before the release date final 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 for real final.txt, but we did finally get another new day before trailer. Wow, this seems pretty professional to me. This seems like it could have been made by a studio with multiple AAA titles under their belt. I mean, it's really impre- oh. Oh, they ripped off a Call of Duty Zombies trailer. Oops. Is it cause for concern that the studio behind an extremely large undertaking of a game that's seeking to reinvent a genre that's been beaten to death for the last 10 years is out here shot for shot copying the trailer for one of the most popular multiplayer games of all time, showing that they really have no capacity for original thought? Maybe. What's almost worse is that this trailer showed literally everything we had already seen in the original reveal trailer and the release date trailer. Actually, it might even show less. I mean, sure, the environment is different in all of these trailers, but we've still been given no sense of 
why we're doing what we're doing in the game, how character progression works, is there a story, what separates it from games like The Division, which everyone is comparing it to? Or what about showing off player grouping systems and interaction? I mean, you showed us kind of voice chat in the first trailer, it would be cool to see more of that since this is an MMO after all, right? I mean, this game releases in just over a month and we still know almost nothing, so this release date is gonna be interesting. What's that? It's delayed again. In early 2023, Fantastic posted a statement, you know, as they do, to say that the Steam page was taken down at the request of a private individual. Well, to be totally honest, at first, they said it was taken down due to a bug on Steam's end, but later it was proven that they took it down themselves because of this request, which was, you know, just the reason the entire time. But they just had to lie really quickly. The private individual who requested this takedown was a South Korean creator of a calendar app called The Day Before. After the game had been announced and started gathering a lot of hype, the creator of this app decided to go file a trademark in the United States before Fantastic could do it. This makes things seem kind of shady from the calendar app developers if you take fantastic statement at face value. But people looked into it and that calendar app came out in 2010 and registered a trademark in Korea where the developer is based in 2015, six years before the game the day before was ever even announced. So filing a trademark in the United States after the day before was announced just seems like this company covering their bases and protecting their brand. What doesn't make sense is announcing a game that you've been working on for three years apparently, garnering millions of views, tons of hype, wishlists on Steam, and at no point before or during checking to see if the name was already trademarked by somebody else because, you know, that's what a company would do. That's what a company should do. That's what any good developer would do. Most normal companies would have trademarked that name before even announcing the game. It's just a normal thing to do. This is maybe the innocent mistake of a relatively new developer, but honestly, have they earned the benefit of the doubt? <laughs> Sorry, it's really more of an indication of the lack of detail and care they put into their projects. Clearly, Fantastic knew how this would look, and just days after the delay was announced, they came out and said, well, actually, we were gonna delay it anyway, so we're not stupid, you're stupid. This sent conversations about the day before being a scam to a fever pitch, and Fantastic did not like hearing all the mean things people had to say on their Reddit and Discord. So as they've done many times before, they put out another statement. We've been creating the game for four years. All these years have been full of sweat and blood to make this game. Why is there blood involved? I don't care if that's a figure of speech, I don't like it. We made a real inner breakthrough and we decided to go for big challenges from the bottom. So big that some people will consider them impossible. Making a fantastic journey from the very ends of the earth, we feel like that simple guy from the 90s action movies. You probably remember him as the hero who breaks through the veil of disbelief when no one believes in him. But he finds the inner strength to win and prove to everyone what he is worth in the end. Oh, what? <laughs> okay, that's it. I need to look deeper into who this company is. They're extremely strange. Fantastic was founded in 2015 by this man, Edward Gutovsev. I have a really hard time pronouncing that last name, I'm sorry. From everything I found, they were originally headquartered in Russia, but every new piece of information points them to being in Singapore, so I think that's where they are now. Well, they're not anywhere now, but we'll get to that. They released four games before the day before. The Wild 8 in 2017, The Dead Dozen and The Radiant One in 2018, and Prop Night in 2021. So this team had made games before, some that were even pretty decently reviewed. I mean, just look at their website. According to them, Prop Night is the top selling Steam game. I looked at historical Steam sales data and couldn't find them on the top charts ever, but you know, they wouldn't lie. <laughs> but the history of Fantastic only gets weirder because the company wasn't even incorporated until 2021. They had already made three games at that point and apparently, according to Edward, had already started working on the day before. There's also the whole issue that their social media pages don't really give off professional game development studio vibes. At the bottom or at the peak, Grateful for every fallen rise. Thank you all. Love you all. That's what a 14-year-old girl posts on Twitter when she just went through a breakup. Get ready for the best survival experience of the year, November 10th. Test message. 
We all live in a time of disinformation and a lack of fact-checking. Anyone can say anything for views, and everyone will believe it. Disinformation needs to be dealt with. This is extra funny when you consider that the release tweet for the day before got fact-checked on Twitter, a website that is entirely known for disinformation, so this is just kind of, this is just a really funny statement. <laughs> I wanted to figure out the size of Fantastic exactly, so I did some research, and I found a site called Rocket Reach, which reported on the number of employees that Fantastic has. I'm not 100% sure of the validity of this site, but almost every site I saw had around the same number, and that number is... 34! 34! Did I make it spin again? Oh. Oh. <laughs> that is 34 full-time paid volunteers. Employees, as you and I would call them, but volunteers as Fantastic wants us to call them. That's a shockingly small number for a team working on what's supposed to be a state-of-the-art MMO. It's not impossible to make a game with a team this small. I mean, there are solo devs all over the place, but for an MMO, it's gonna be kind of tough to pull this off, I feel like. So a reporter from Yahoo News, which, yes, still exists, decided to go check the publicly listed business address of Fantastic to find out how legit this operation was. And what they found when they got there was a co-working space, like a WeWork, basically, but in Singapore. But Fantastic doesn't actually use it. It's just a virtual space they use, and they just list it as their business address. Things get interesting, though, because on Google, they have a different listed business address still in Singapore. And when the reporter went to go check that out, there was no trace of Fantastic. It was actually a management consulting company that was based there. It wasn't even a co-working space. So, I, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I guess I don't know what I know, but I guess... You know. Listen, I'm not one to hate on remote work at all, but game development is something that is rarely done fully remotely. There's usually at least some cohesive office space, maybe to bring voice actors in or to just work together on a cohesive vision. But in Fantastic's case, both publicly listed addresses either are not actively in use by Fantastic or have nothing to do with Fantastic, which is just, it's alarming. Luckily, Fantastic did post a video about what life at Fantastic is like, so we can learn more from watching that. They brag about how extreme their work conditions are, you know, like working on a beach or working on a hill or making your devs work in negative 71 degrees Celsius in the outdoors. Just let them work inside. This is no condition to be working in. There's an entire section of them just shooting guns. Is this so they can do research on recoil or spray patterns so they can have better realistic guns for their game? Maybe. They don't say that's what they're doing. I think they're just shooting guns. There's also an entire section where they recreate the day that one of their employees got evicted from their apartment just two days before Christmas. <laughs> I think they did this to show how supportive they are of their employees, but like you didn't have to have this guy reenact his trauma for us. Like I would have just believed you if you said this was a good place to work. They also didn't even say what they did to help him. They just said that it happened and they were like, hey man, it's okay. So I hope that guy found a place to live. <laughs> I don't know the resolution of that story. Then there's also this guy who talks about all the negative messages he reads and he gets, <laughs> he gets really sad. But then they cut to this other guy who's like really happy, so... It's, you know, it's great to work there. They even have an interview with one of their external volunteers. This guy's apparently a marketing expert, so, you know, they have unpaid labor in the marketing department. Super cool. Maybe that's why the marketing has been so bad. Just saying. But by far the weirdest thing about this video is it just ends with multiple AI voiceovers that are supposed to be testimonials from employees, I guess? In my free time, I also work as a DJ for free on the famous Bangla Road. I am a volunteer for life, and I like to entertain people. The day before is my dream project. I will be pleased if people love my sounds in the game. Maybe that's just because these employees didn't want to be shown on camera or couldn't speak English well enough, but they had an actual person translate into English before without AI. So it just, I, I, I can't make sense of this. It's just weird. <laughs> all this is to say, I have no idea who Fantastic are. I don't even know who Edward is. When I go look up all his social media pages, they're all gone and been completely scrubbed clean. The only page that's still actually up is his LinkedIn, 
and all you can see there is his bio which says, In Search of Myself. Yeah, me too, Edward. I'm in search of you too. Where are you? Who are you? In making and marketing the game, Fantastic was very public about their publisher, Mytona, so maybe we can learn a bit more from them since we can't learn anything from Fantastic themselves. Our team has a special mission that we work at every day. We write exciting stories. We design thrilling gameplay. Do you really? Do you really make amazing games? Let's do some research. In their catalog of published games, which isn't really that large, it's almost entirely those cheap mobile games that you'll see the ads for that are trying to scam you into spending hundreds of dollars to speed through their levels. I mean, just look at the thumbnails. You get the idea of what I'm talking about here. And according to Mytona, these have amazing stories. Out of curiosity, Mytona, what's the amazing story behind Tasty Makeover? Which you have listed as a match three game, but the promotional images don't really make me think it's a match three game. It kind of looks like it's a puzzle game or a makeover game or a dating sim. And then like the last image you have is match three. I don't know what this is. I'm not gonna download it. I'm not gross and stupid. The only non-mobile games they have listed are Prop Night and The Day Before, the two fantastic games. So things are looking a little sketchy here for our friends at Mytona. All I'm saying is they don't seem like the traditional backers of a post-apocalyptic MMO. So I, I don't know what's going on really, in conclusion. The day was almost here. The trademark dispute had been settled. The November 10th release date was set in stone with the Steam page restored. And so when the clock struck November 10th, the game got delayed again. Okay, it's one more small little delay to December 7th, 2023, but this time it's actually gonna come out, okay? The really, believe us. And the hype was in the air. People camped outside their computers to have the privilege of being the first to spend $40 on a game that even the most hardened fans thought was fake at this point. But it was finally coming out and they would finally be able to play their dream game. But just before the game was officially released, Fantastic released a statement. You know, like they always do. To our future player who will dive into the game on December 7th. We made this for you so that you will enjoy the game and it becomes a celebration. Together we will continue improving the game and adding content. To a person who didn't believe us, we made this game for you too. We accept any kind of criticism and don't hold a grudge against you. Before we continue moving forward together, kindly allow us to note a few things. Please don't accuse us of scamming. That's not true. We didn't take a penny from anyone. Please don't accuse us of asset flip. That's not true also. Our team worked day and night for five years to make our dream game a reality. Oh, hi, Mark. And with that, definitely not a projection statement, players could finally enter the world of the day before. I just want to fight, but it's like nobody's here. Are there like any zombies or players? So if you don't have any ammo, you can't defend yourself. Oh, God. This is, this is going to be the whole fucking experience, isn't it? Come and get me. You can't. I'm too high up. The fact that it's like a, almost a full price game is crazy. Uh, so things went well. The Steam reviews were immediately flooded with overwhelmingly negative responses. Just a few hours after the game, only 19% of the reviews were positive. And I'm actually not sure how there were 19% of the reviews that were positive. PC games, Rock Paper Shotgun, Games Radar, every single content creator you can think of was just ripping this game apart for how much of a scam it appeared to be. Even IGN, who had been close with Fantastic through the development of the day before, getting exclusive trailer releases and interviews, gave Gave the game a brutal one rating. For context, these are the same people that gave Call of Duty Black Ops 3 a 9.2. Black Ops 3, not 2, not 1, 3, the third one. Some people said the game was unfinished, but calling it unfinished is honestly a little mean to unfinished games. This game didn't even feel like it was started. <laughs> Look at it. The game was a shell of what it had promised to be. The missions were short, repetitive, and they just generally felt pointless. Like all you would ever do is go out, collect some loot, go back to the Woodbury colony and sell it. And I guess you just repeat, there was no real why given. The base building was lackluster and just felt like it was tacked on last minute. And the worst part is I didn't ever see a greedy raccoon boss. 
So what was this about, Edward? The gunfighting was clunky, and the delays between shooting a zombie and them responding was like a full second, which is just unacceptable. To be fair, the city was pretty large, and that's good, because it had to fit a bunch of players, right? It's an MMO. Oh, wait, what's that? It can only fit 32 players a server? It can only fit 32 players a server? This meant that you could go hours without running into another player in the open world, and the zombie density was also super low, so you would just not be finding anyone or anything for days before. This was literally a running simulator in what was promised to be an action-adventure survival MMO, and it wasn't any of those things. But what's even more egregious than what the game was is what the game wasn't. In most survival games, ammo is a precious resource because guns are super powerful against things like zombies and especially other players. That means you have an incentive to conserve your ammo when you find it, so you can resort to things like melee combat when you absolutely don't need to use your guns. In the day before, there's no melee combat. No melee weapons, no punching, no kicking, nothing. If you were out of ammo, you were literally useless. This is just such a basic piece of functionality that like any game would have, let alone a, a survival game. Just like, I don't get it. I don't get how this was missing. How is this missing? How do you not have this? There is also the mysterious lack of voice chat, you know, the thing they showed off in the first trailer? The only way to communicate with other players was by talking to them with the in-game text chat. This really greatly reduces the fun you can have in a game like this. I mean, proximity chat is half the fun of player interaction in these games. And yeah, also, yeah, you just kind of broke a promise, a pretty a pretty big promise. But hey, I've done some development and even multiplayer development in my day, so I understand how hard voice chat can be to implement. I mean, you can't just buy some sort of package on a game engine marketplace and plop it into your game. It's it's not that easy. And if it was, I mean, you wouldn't want to be you wouldn't want to be doing that too much. You wouldn't want to be making the habit of that, would you? Would you? <laughs> Remember that time Fnatic got super defensive about asset flipping? Well, that might have something to do with all the assets they bought from the Unreal Marketplace to make their game. In case you're unaware, asset flipping is when a game uses pre-made assets like 3D models or pre-written code and entirely relies upon those to make their game, adding really nothing new to them. Oops. Sorry, don't want to be showing too much skin here. Don't get me wrong, it's okay to use pre-made assets. In a lot of cases, it creates a more stable game. But if you're just going to use pre-made assets, then you're not really making a game, are you? User XX Austin James posted a huge list on Pacebin that showed all of the assets from the Unreal Marketplace that Fantastic used in the day before. As you can tell, this list is, it's long. Another user on Imgur posted what they claimed are data mined files from the day before, showing all the asset packs they had actually purchased. In the interest of full disclosure, I did my best to confirm that this list was authentic, and I couldn't do that. All I'm saying is, has Fantastic earned the benefit of the doubt? Probably not. Multiple users have put out their own separate lists, and they all seem to line up with what this is showing. So I am going to say that, at least for fun, this list is legit. And we're not talking about a few assets here. We're talking about all of these assets. Just kidding. We're talking about all of these assets. Is it still going? I hope it's still going. I guess I'm editing it. I can make it go as long as I want. Oh, no, it's over now. Remember how they showed off their voice comms and proximity chat in the first trailer? Yeah, they actually probably tried to do that because they purchased an asset called Easy Voice Chat. The reviews for this plugin were pretty good too, so if this plugin was in the final build, why is it not usable in the game? I'm going to guess it has something to do with the lack of documentation that comes with it, as one reviewer states. This basically means that the package could be a little hard to use or figure out for people without a lot of development experience. You know, like the people at Fantastic. That got me thinking that maybe this reviewer is one of the developers at Fantastic, proving without a shadow of a doubt that they did use this asset pack in their game and still not have voice chat. A quick Google search of the name Nico Rico 123 led me to this YouTube channel with a single video called PP Got Money. Maybe in this video, Nico Rico is talking about game development or something that will link them to game development and that way we can prove that this channel is associated with that review. You throw a rock, it hits my hard cock. My cock turns red, then we hit the bed.
okay, or, or not. But luckily, there's also a Steam profile with the username NicoRico123, and if you look at the comments on that Steam page, they're all accusing this of being the personal account of the developer Nick, N-I-K. In case you don't know, Nick was the name of a TikToker who made the famous scam game, Greed of Man. This video by Big Fight TV goes into the scam in more detail, but as you can see, when they show Nick's TikTok page, which has now been cleansed, there's the same profile picture on this as there is on the Steam page. And also, Nico Rico 123 has played 92 hours of Greed of Man, which no one has ever done, which I think means conclusively that this review by Nico Rico 123 is the developer of Greed of Man, one of the big scam games, just like how the day before is a scam game. <sighs> I'm not really sure what the point of all that was, but I went down that rabbit hole and now so did you, so you're welcome. All I know is that even just by comparing with your own eyes the assets in the day before and the assets in the Unreal Marketplace, they heavily relied on, if not entirely relied on, pre-made assets. So I think it's fair to call the game nothing more than an asset flip. No matter how many times Fantastic begs you not to call it an asset flip. So the release was a disaster. According to some leaked telegram messages from our old pal Edward, the CEO of Fantastic, the game sold just about 200,000 copies and just about 96,000 were refunded. 46% were refunded. <laughs> he described the game as a financial failure, which I mean, like, yeah, that, <laughs> Yeah. But in their statement before the game came out, they promised to continue updating the game and the day of and after they did release patches to the day before. But just four days after the disastrous release, Fantastic announced that not only was the game removed from Steam, but that the company was closing altogether. The game released at 9.59 a.m. Pacific time on December 7th and shut down around noon Pacific on December 11th. That means it lasted 98 hours before it was removed from Steam. 98 hours, holy crap. It couldn't even last the amount of time that most MMO players tell you you need to play their game to enjoy it. Edward Gatovsev has completely cleansed his online presence. His Twitter has been deleted, the fantastic YouTube channel is gone, the fantastic website is gone, it just redirects you to this message that they posted on Twitter already. So Edward's gone, and I miss him. Come back to us, Edward. What are you scared of? And let's talk about Mytona, who published this game and are just as responsible for its failure as Fantastic are. Let's remember that in an interview with Fantastic, they claimed that Mytona was checking every build of the game at each stage, which either means Mytona wasn't doing that, or they're really bad at checking things. Kind of like me in, in chess. Check. I don't know how to play chess. This whole situation leaves me with two main questions. Number one, when did this game actually start being made? They claim it started in 2019, but the end result definitely tells me it was not made in 2019. A lot of the assets they used in the game and relied heavily on didn't even come out until 2022. So I don't buy the 2019 thing. I don't buy it at all. And two, how bad was the financial situation that after just four days of the game being out, you were already out of money to continue? continue operating. I know it's just a lame excuse the CEO made so he could go run and hide, but it's just such an insane excuse that I can't wrap my mind around it. Steam doesn't pay out its devs until the month after the payment period, so the earliest that anyone from Fantastic was seeing money for the day before was going to be in late January. So if the game did really well, were you still going to shut down because your margins were that thin? You needed the money like right now? I obviously know that's not what would have happened, but it just makes this excuse seem weird. You ran out of money? Like, I know you're projecting, but come on, just at least try before just shutting down four days later. I think that's the worst part of all of this. They could have actually tried to make a decent game. They clearly had people capable of real game development. I mean, Prop Night is... Not a great game, but it was playable and even enjoyable. And when you did dig yourself into too deep of a hole, you could have maybe, you know, put out some patches for the next month or two and see if you could have really improved the game. You probably wouldn't have been able to, but it would have been nice to see you try. I guess at least with this outcome, no one else gets scammed into buying it and everyone's getting their refunds. So, you know, that's, that's good at least. So maybe APB's 79 day MMO wasn't truly rock bottom. In this genre, we somehow always find a way to dig ourselves into a deeper hole. But I kind of hope that the 98 hour record doesn't ever get broken because it took a lot of 
just disastrous, depressing things to hit that record. And uh, it'd be pretty sad if that happened again. Um, you want to see my animation for the number 34 again? Oh, wow, you um, made it to the end of the video. This was a long one, so that's a little bit concerning for you, don't, don't you think? But thanks. If you made it this far, why don't you leave a comment that says, so that happened, <laughs> um, because it did. Uh, because it happened. I want to give a shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Their names have been going across the screen for like probably at least three seconds now, and they're all amazing. I want to give a special shout out, of course, to the members of my ah tier. My window's open. I wonder if my neighbors heard me screaming. Don't call the cops. It's just John Sexum, Kuno Bazi, a hobo with a spork, Suede Oxford, and of course, Paradox. They're all insane, but I love them with all of my heart, which grew three sizes. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Okay, go. The video is over. You're, you're being weird. Leave. Just, just, just go. Dude, what the? Just get, get out of here.